welcome back to Not Another Fucking Elf, an in-depth Lord of the Rings character guide podcast, hosted by my fellow Lord of the Rings nerd, Paul Ridd. Hello there. And me, Catherine Bray, ditto a Lord of the Rings nerd. As ever, let's quickly recap. Another podcast in an ocean of podcasts. Really? Yes, really, because we are the authoritative figures to speak about this stuff. No one has ever come up with anything as good as this. No one's ever made a Lord of the Rings podcast before, have they? We wanted to put this podcast together because we love Lord of the Rings and because we wanted to move through the characters in a sort of uh, interesting order and discuss their role in the story, how they've been presented in media and what they mean overall in the arc of the story and outwards into other possible meanings. Yeah, so in each episode we're looking at a different character, um, we're moving in an order that only we know There's why a secret meaning to it, where if you listen to all 3,000 episodes at the end, it will emerge. A pattern will emerge. But yeah, so we're looking at all the characters, what they're all about, how they come across in the adaptations, if indeed they made it into the adaptations, which isn't always the case, as we will find in today's episode. Yes, indeed. And we're called Not Another Fucking Elf as a little reference, a little uh, sort of... Uh, a tribute. Little, tribute. Little yeah, shout little, out. Little shout out um, to the Inklings, Tolkien's gang of university mates who used to get together for a beer and critique each other's writing. And supposedly Tolkien's friend Hugo Dyson had had it to hear with these fucking elves at some point and expressed that. <laughs> Yeah, a polite man. So that's what he's meant to have said anyway when the latest one popped up in a reading. Um, although it obviously wasn't recorded, so we don't know for sure. It could have been, God, not another bloody elf. Not another cunting elf. I don't know if we could have made it the title if it was not another cunting elf. Maybe. Anyway, who are we discussing today? Today we are going to have a chat about a character called Tom Bombadil. But before we do that, your regular reminder that we are assuming that there's no such thing as spoilers, that you listeners to a Lord of the Rings character guide podcast are not listening to this as a sort of warm-up prep to reading the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, and I suppose the the spoiler warning here might be particularly prescient for this episode because um, anyone who's watched film versions of Lord of the Rings but not read the books yet, Tom Bombadil doesn't figure. Yeah, he famously doesn't appear in the majority of adaptations. So if you haven't read the book, um, but you have seen, for example, the Peter Jackson films, all of this is going to be just a baffling revelation of some guy that you've never encountered before. It's spoiler city. So that's your warning. This Tom Bombadil episode contains spoilers for Tom Bombadil. (laughs) So let's get things started. Who is Tom Bombadil? He is... Like we've done that. That's a direct quote, isn't it? Yeah, that's what Tom Bombadil's wife, Goldberry, says to Frodo when he asks who Tom Bombadil is. He is. Yeah, it's enigmatic. But we're starting the story in the middle a little bit there. Yeah, yeah. So Tom Bombadil first appears in The Lord of the Rings in the middle of a bit of a kind of hobbit emergency. So the four principal hobbits have left the Shire. Um, but they haven't reached the village of Bree yet, and that's where they're hoping to meet Gandalf. So they're very much on their own, they're being pursued by the ringwraiths, and in order to try and avoid those, they take this shortcut through the old forest that turns a bit disastrous. It's a place they've been warned about, and wouldn't you just know it, they pretty quickly get into difficulties with a malevolent tree, Old Man Willow, who kind of swallows Pippin and Merry into the earth. Yeah, it's a very vivid image, and but in the nick of time, Along comes this guy called Tom Bombadil. A merry fellow. Indeed, who sings to Old Man Willow, or rather at Old Man Willow, commanding him to release the hobbits. They then spend a relatively pleasant night at Tom Bombadil's house with Tom and his wife Goldberry. Then the four hobbits set off once more, but quickly get lost in the fog on the Barrow Downs. Yeah, and wouldn't you just know it, they they once again become trapped um, by a Barrow White this time. It's kind of like a ghost that haunts a kind of a grave in the ground, lots of jewellery and stuff. And again, Bombadil comes along and rescues them. And this time he's like, you fucked up twice. I will come with you this time to the borders of the land, which he does and sees them safely on the road to the village of Bree. And as we said up top, if you're familiar with The Lord of the Rings from Peter Jackson's films or from the BBC 1981 radio adaptation or from Ralph Bakshi's animated version, this is all probably sounding very unfamiliar. Yeah, none of this stuff makes it into any of those. We'll talk about why a bit later on. But first, 
let's talk a bit more about what Tom Bombadil actually is like in the book. So Tom Bombadil in the book, where does he fit into the sort of mythos? He's not an elf, he's not a dwarf, not a hobbit, not a man, or is he a man? <laughs> he's not a man, but he he, kind of, he looks more like a man than he does anything else. He's a bit shorter than most men, but like taller than, you know, a, a dwarf or a hobbit. Uh, he's got a beard, he's got jolly red cheeks, and he wears a bright blue jacket and uh, yellow boots. Um, and he sings absolutely all the time. The guy loves to sing. And he's based on a doll, I think. Yes, he's based on a doll that Tolkien's children had. So uh, what are the copyright implications of that? I'm not sure. Are there any? Uh... <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So it's a uh, public domain doll or the copyright's expired either way. Um, yeah, so I don't think the Tolkien estate is about to hit, be hit by a big sort of Tom Bombadil legal dispute <laughs> in the makers of an early 20th century children's doll. <laughs> so anyway, Tom Bombadil is a character. It very much predates The Lord of the Rings. He's probably part of what I guess we would call like oral tradition Tolkien, stuff that kind of comes out of the world of make-believe with your kids, and certainly his earliest written references are from the 1920s, well before The Lord of the Rings and well before The Hobbit as well. And we can see in Tolkien's letters when he's trying to figure out how to actually write a sequel to the like unexpectedly, wildly successful Hobbit, that he has this moment where Tom Bombadil is seen as kind of possible material for the Hobbit sequel, like maybe even a lead character. Let's, um, let's read a bit of that now. So for context, this is Tolkien replying to his publisher, who has just rejected, for now, the idea of publishing the material that will eventually go on to become the Silmarillion, but who says that he is interested in a sequel to The Hobbit and, you know, what, what could that be? I did not think any of the stuff I dropped on you filled the bill, but I did want to know whether any of the stuff had any exterior non-personal value. I think it is plain that quite apart from it, a sequel or successor to The Hobbit is called for. I promise to give this thought and attention, but I am sure you will sympathise when I say that the construction of elaborate and consistent mythology and two languages rather occupies the mind, and the Silmarils are in my heart, so that goodness knows what will happen. Mr. Baggins began as a comic tale among conventional and inconsistent Grimm's fairy tale dwarves and got drawn into the edge of it, so that even Sauron the Terrible peeped over the edge. And what more can hobbits do? They can be comic, but their comedy is suburban, unless it is set against things more elemental. But the real fun about orcs and dragons, to my mind, was before their time. Perhaps a new, if similar line. Do you think Tom Bombadil, the spirit of the vanishing Oxford and Berkshire countryside, could be made into the hero of a story? Or is he, as I suspect, fully enshrined in the enclosed verses? Still, I could enlarge the portrait. Wild to imagine a version of The Lord of the Rings where Tom Bombadil was the lead yes. character. Yes. Just to, unimaginable. The, <laughs> <laughs> just it, already the amount of Tom Bombadil we get in Lord of the Rings feels pushing the <laughs> levels of endurance for, for, for uh, a full story. But Is um, he not your favourite character? He's not my favourite. <laughs> I mean, if it was Tom Bombadil that had somehow come into the possession of the Ring of Power, like how would that work? I guess yeah, maybe Bil so Bilbo would still have picked it up in the in the Hobbit, but then they're trying to figure out what to do with it. Maybe we'll take it to Tom Bombadil, and then I don't know. Is he the guy who goes on Frodo's quest and goes to Mordor with the Ring? It's just a full-on musical. You'd have to put up with so much singing, yeah. just kind of. Classic, like, in Moria, let's all we'll be very quiet, everybody. Oh, Tom Bombadil! <laughs> Endless scrapes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, his function is to move the story along, but also be a saviour to our hapless heroes at that point in the story, isn't he? So I don't know how it could quite work, him being the focus of the whole story himself. Yeah, I don't know, because... It, uh... <sighs> It's tricky because he's comic and obviously the hobbits are comic as well and they work perfectly well when you set them in a fellowship with the sort of more serious characters for them to play off. Bombadil is comic but he's like he's also an authority. He can command Barrow Whites and um, Old Man Willow yeah. and all of that kind of thing. So, he controls nature, right? Like yeah. He can natural, speak to trees, he can keep the, keep trees at bay um yeah <laughs> so it's kind of it's a bit of the problem that 
Tolkien had in The Hobbit and in The Lord of the Rings with Gandalf is that if you've got a wizard with you, a wizard is basically too handy. He, in The Hobbit, sends Gandalf off on this kind of side quest with the White Council to deal with the necromancer. And in The Lord of the Rings, obviously, he carks it off a bridge with the Balrog and then doesn't pop up again until later. And that's all really helpful for giving your um, less powerful characters the chance to be out on an adventure on their own and actually be a bit vulnerable. So I suppose Bombadil, he's, he has to perform a similar kind of narrative sleight of hand. But in Bombadil's case, it's uh, a geographical containment um, rather than the metaphysical one of Gandalf passing into another realm for a bit. Bombadil just refuses to pass the borders of his land because his powers are contained within that land. So... Um, I think that's how he solves that, but obviously Tolkien realised at some point that Tom Bombadil was not going to be like the lead character of Lord of the Rings. Mm, mm. I do, that said, have a soft spot for both of the adventures that the Hobbits get into with Tom. The stuff with Merry and Pippin getting almost absorbed into the ground by the trees, that's some creepy stuff. Yeah, super vivid. And like that's something that you lose by cutting out that whole section, isn't it, from a cinematic point of view? Well, I think we normally save the clips for later on in the episode, but I want to play a clip now because it's actually the sequence where in the extended edition of Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, Merry and Pippin get sucked into the ground by a tree. And I think it's because Peter Jackson rightly recognises that the sequence is so cinematic that even if you're not going to do Tom Bombadil and you're not going to have the Hobbits go to the Old Forest, well, hey, you've got these guys in a forest anyway. Why not move that little adventure yeah. up a bit and and do that anyway? So let's have a let's have a listen to Mary and Pippin. I mean, I'm, it's just going to sound like them getting stuck, isn't it? Yeah, but bear yeah. with us and just imagine Mary and Pippin being trapped by tree roots as you listen to this. What's happening? Ah! Ah! I've got my leg. should not be waking. Eat earth, dig deep, drink water, go to sleep. Away with you. Come, the forest is waking up. It isn't safe. So he gives Treebeard Bombadil's lines mm -hmm. for freeing the hobbits from, from the tree. Which I think is, it's like, on the one hand, it's not it's it's too cinematic to pass up. He's not Peter Jackson's not going to not include that little escapade. On the other hand, it's not cinematic enough to make it into the theatrical cut. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's nice that it's in there. Yeah, you know, it's nice that Bombadil kind of lurks in the, the ghost bones of Bombadil of, is there somehow. Um, the Barrow White, Old Man Willow, Bombadil, and Treebeard are all kind of part of the same sort of thing. Yeah. But Treebeard makes it in because he has plot consequences yeah. in terms of the trashing of Isengard, whereas those other guys, you can lift them out. Yeah. So yeah, I'm glad that Old Man Willow got in, in there in, in a certain form. And the Barrowites as well, I think is a fantastic adventure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think the idea of having two situations of peril for the Hobbits so early in, on in the story is great from a kind of... Uh, a uh, narrative point of view of reading, but as a, as a sort of filmic device, maybe would have been just one on two, too many perils to experience prior to the real action of the story kicking off. I think, yeah, you don't want to distract from the ring rates because they're the main problem for the hobbits on their journey from the Shire to Rivendell and having this side adventure with Barrow Whites and, and with uh, Old Man Willow, that feels like in a way, in, in cinematic terms, it would diminish the effect of the ring mm -hmm. So what does the Barrow White, what, what does that sort of sequence of the Barrow Whites symbolise in terms of the the kind of treasure and the, the ghostliness of it? Is, is it just a sort of, is it again back to Tolkien's idea that none of this symbolises anything other than what it <laughs> functions in the story as? Well, it certainly links back to the ancient history because it's the mm. idea that the witch king of Angmar used to have his kingdom up that way in mm. the north. That adventure with Frodo barely escaping with his life and managing to rescue his friends purely by calling on Bombadil is a great little adventure. And then, yeah, they, they get all of this treasure and they get the 
the swords that the or they're, they're kind of their knives, but to the hobbits, their sword size that the hobbits carry with them for the rest of the quest. And yeah, and isn't Mary's uh, the the sword that he gains in that sequence? Isn't that the thing that then is so important to the eventual death of the the Witch King? That's the thing which enables him to stab the the Witch King of Angmar on, on Pelennor Fields. So it's setting something up really, really early doors. Yeah, it's all later. cause and effect across histories. The idea that uh, someone thousands of years ago can be responsible for something like forging a knife that, you know, way later actually goes on to fulfil its purpose in a way that he couldn't have imagined. Yeah. But yeah, he would have been a pretty weird lead character. Oh, for sure. <laughs> I like the little, like, pairing that they do with him and Gandalf. Like, right at the end of The Lord of the Rings, Gandalf says that, um, you know, this is after the, they've won, after they've taken down Sauron he says he's going to go and have a long talk with Bombadil he describes himself as like a rolling stone and Bombadil as a moss gatherer um so we never get to see this kind of fantastic confabulation I mean I imagine they smoked I imagine mm. there was a lot of singing yeah, I mean, so much singing <laughs> so much singing and smoking so that's that's nice and there's also these kind of weird I think Bombadil is stitched very weirdly into the narrative because he also says that he knows Farmer Maggot. Oh, he sorts out the, all the business with the horse, doesn't he? The one of the horse, the, the huge like protracted horse negotiation in Bree that's <laughs> yeah. resolved eventually by Bombadil, who brings back a horse to the town. Yeah, so all of the hobbits horses get scared away or stolen and eventually make their way back to Bombadil who looks after them as he would because he's a nice guy who's kind to beasts and birds and nature but then he later hears what's happened and sends the horses back to Bree so he is sort of connected to the world outside his land he also says that he knows Farmer Maggot who um, puts the hobbits up just before they go into the old forest um, and there's this implication that Farmer Maggot too is slightly more important than the Hobbits might have thought. Mm. I think that I don't know whether that's in there just as continuity with the Bombadil poetry that Tolkien had published because he's Farmer Maggot pops up in that as well. Yeah. It's a bit kind of Tolkien extended yeah. universe, like he's trying to smooth over some of the cracks between ah. the different narratives, maybe. Um, and Elrond has heard of him as well. Elrond is like maybe I should have summoned him to the council. Um, but he probably wouldn't have come. No. And there's this bit of debate at the council where where it's like people are talking about whether they could, you know, enlist Bombadil's help. But then that kind of goes away again after a while. He's There's these tendrils of Bombadil out into the wider world of Gandalf and Elrond and Hobbits, but essentially he is a self-contained kind of unit of narrative. And he's certainly not the lead character. <laughs> it's interesting, though, because we don't know how, if he had been absorbed into the wider story later on how his more comedic or more fairy tale like facets might have been shaped and, and and hewed by the story in the way that the hobbits are the way they become much more sort of serious and less um silly as the as the story progresses yeah that's true i mean mary by the end is capable of cracking a hobbit style joke but then also taking down a witch king mm. um Pippin, you know, he rescues Faramir from his dad when his dad's like, you're going to burn. Mm -hmm. um, they're all capable of these great acts, but retain their es essential hobbitiness. And I would guess that we would see something like that with Bombadil, although he already has that seriousness to him as well. Yeah. I'm not sure if we're any nearer to answering that core question we've set ourselves of what is Bombadil? Yeah, I mean... Bombadil seems like this very kind of contentious character and people have a lot of different theories about what Bombadil is. His names are sort of lightly helpful here, aren't they? Should we take a look at those? Yeah, so Tom Bombadil itself is a Bucklandish name. Um, so something that the Hobbits of Buckland came up with. But to the elves and the rangers, he's known in Cinder and Elvish as Yarwain ben Adar, which translates to oldest and fatherless. And then in Rohan, he goes by Orald, which is just like it sounds really an old English word meaning very ancient, very old or old. <laughs> and then to the dwarves he is called Form, which is Old Norse and means that he belongs to ancient days. So like a bit of a theme there. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> very yeah, yeah. much getting the sense that this guy has been around for a while. Yeah, he's one of the sort of glut of characters who've existed for very, very long periods of time, right? Yeah, yeah. So 
you know, any of the wizards, they've been around since the beginning. People like Elrond, or elves rather, like Elrond, they're extremely ancient. Treebeard, I think, has also been around since the year Dot, as far as we can tell. So we, de we do know that about him. We know that he's old, but what is he? Yes, yeah, so maybe we should talk about some of the theories um, of what Bombadil is. Um, so do you want to kick it off? Yeah, so to start with a big one, there's this idea that Bombadil is God. Right. <laughs> or uh, like Bombadil is God from the perspective of Tolkien's mythos, which is to say that he is Eru Iluvata. And it's an interesting idea because the bit that we quoted earlier where Goldberry says he is about Bombadil, that kind of echoes that sort of biblical yeah. I am around God. In the beginning was the word and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Tolkien in general, though, doesn't like, overlap his own Christianity that directly with the world of the Lord of the Rings. And it's an interesting one because I suppose it comes back to whether you think there's an interventionist God at work in Arda, in Middle Earth. And there's quite clearly there's like messengers and emissaries of the Maya and the Valar. But it doesn't seem really like God himself is going to be hanging out in a forest and sort of helping to the extent of getting people out of barrow white tombs and, you know, out of the roots of trees, but he's not going to help outside of that land. That, that doesn't feel consistent to me with the sort of theology of Middle Earth. No, no. I suppose the idea of a very, very ancient old man who lives in union with a forest that he's sort of in some way a controller of or a creator of maybe that's quite a sort of straight up christian imagery that's quite straight up christian imagery isn't it the idea of an eden-like place with an old man who lives in it and controls mm. it yeah so i suppose the old forest would be a kind of a, a post eden thing yeah it's, it's quite spooky and with bad shit happening there yeah so yeah and he's also got a wife which doesn't feel like a massively godly thing no. in the Christian mythos. In, you know, ancient Greek theology, yeah, you could have... I think he, he like, that's the closest we could probably come to agreeing with this theory is that he could be a god. Mm -hmm. I don't think he is, like, the one, the creator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I suppose also there's a kind of Santa Claus-like quality to him as well. <laughs> Bombadil is Santa Claus. Yeah, that's the new theory. New theory, yeah, I quite like that. Theory number two... Bombadil is Santa Claus. <laughs> Would you care to elucidate on well, that one? Well, you know, he lives in... Well, actually, that's, it, does, it, it stretches as far as he has a wife. <laughs> <laughs> I love that that's your case for it. He has a wife and he's very benevolent. All right, um, so what other people with wives can we come <laughs> up with? <laughs> I'm trying to remember whether in The Tempest, if Prospero has or has had a wife. I mean, he's got a daughter... So in, hmm. he must have, there must have been a Mrs. Prospera at some point. And I'm sure if I was to go back now and find out, I'm sure that there is an allusion to a lost <laughs> wife in, in The Tempest. I'm but just... that idea of him as a Prospero figure, I think that's quite interesting. Because, yeah. again, it's that idea of someone with a little kingdom of their own and they're very powerful within that kingdom, but their power maybe doesn't extend outside of that kingdom. That's, yeah. that's quite nice. I like that. Yeah. Then if we go on to the second theory... No, oh, Santa Claus is now the second theory, so... Well, the third theory after Santa Claus, or the fourth after Santa Claus and Prospero, um, <laughs> the fourth theory would be that he is music. He embodies music. Yeah, so in Tolkien's creation mythology, the world starts with multiple songs and spirits kind of singing together in harmony until Melkor, one of the spirits, sort of starts to introduce a discord, he ultimately goes on to become the first Dark Lord, Morgoth, and Sauron is one of his servants. But yeah, this idea that Tom is a sort of physical incarnation of that early music. What do we think of that? For someone who sings a lot, that's, that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, that's it. I think there is this sense of song running through him. Uh, he is at his most powerful seemingly when he sings. He uses song to defeat Old Man Willow. He uses song to defeat the Barrow Whites. So I guess that's where that, that idea in the fandom comes from, the idea that he is music. Counterpoints, he's also clearly a man. Yeah, <laughs> a with man a wife. Being. <laughs> so if he is music, then he's a sort of incarnated form of music that does lots of other things that music isn't capable of doing, like eating yeah. honeycomb cakes. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and then if we go on to the next theory... 
a lot of people also think that he might be a Valar or a Maya. Yeah. So these are like the spirits that were there at the very start of the creation of the world. And then some of them are kind of more powerful than others um, without getting into the whole taxonomy of it. There are like 14 really powerful good ones. And then the 15th is Melkor, who's a Rongan. Um, and then they've got sort of sub spirits the Maya who uh, kind of help them mm -hmm. anyway but there's is there a, is, one of the ideas yeah. is, that, is that Bombadil might be one of those at whatever level whether it's one of the super powerful ones or the less powerful ones I like the idea of him being um, on the level of a Gandalf right I think that makes sense yeah I mean which one is another big question because then you go digging into the Silmarillion and most of them are named and it's like well is he one of these and are any of the ancient names that we've just read out of Tom, like, are they any of those, the names that are mentioned in the Silmar Silmarillion? Well, no, they're not. So it's it's a bit tricky. It also, I don't know, the, the thing that goes against this theory for me is just on a gut level, the guy that Tolkien is describing in his poems about Tom Bombadil um, that you know were published separately from The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, it doesn't feel like he's tied into that kind of high mythology. Mm. It feels to me like he's much more elemental, earthy, spirit of the forest kind of vibe. Mm. Yeah, so he doesn't really belong to the more sort of heightened kind of tradition then. Yeah, that's my gut feeling. I mean, you could argue as well that like the Gandalf of The Hobbit doesn't feel like yeah. he does and that these guys are clearly capable of showing different facets of their being to the mortals who inhabit Middle-earth, so... I think that one's probably still sort of open to potentially being, you know, what Tolkien was getting at, but mm. uh, it's not something that he validated. And he, he did kind of think through most of this early Doors Silmarillion stuff in quite a lot of punishing details. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Theory four is just that Tom is Tom, that yeah. Tom Bombadil is this singular, exceptional, not to be found anywhere else, example of a unique creation. Right. I think that's a pretty good theory. Yeah, yeah. Or is he the sort of uh, afterburn or the, the sort of uh, shadow of a different kind of story that just echoes into the first few pages of this massively long, increasingly complicated uh, heroic narrative that he could be the sort of ghost of The Hobbit in a way? Yeah, I like that The Lord of the Rings is very varied in all of its modes and... I love the idea that someone might write something where a, a simple knife that somebody picks up from a treasure hoard has this massive backstory and will go on to do something as significant as take down the witch king of Angmar. But then also the world isn't like that. Sometimes the world is like that in a kind of cause and effect way and you can trace things. Other times stuff is mysterious and we don't know and it's not connected and it's peculiar and it's like a stubby lumpy offshoot weird growth and that I think is probably what Tom Bombadil is he's an exception and a mystery yeah and if he's God if he embodies those qualities if he is the creator or something like why would uh, why would his power be limited just to this small part of that world like in a in a in a universe in which everything is purely maximalist and everything is so huge and these fights are between huge powers why would god be relegated to this little patch of land that's mysterious in itself though isn't it even if it is if that is the case yeah and then there's one final theory that i'm going to start by saying i don't believe okay and i'm also going to say that i don't think the person that advanced this theory was actually serious okay. uh, i think this this theory was put together as a joke but there's quite a lot of people on the internet actually really like it okay. and think this is maybe it. So this theory is that Tom Bombadil and the Witch King of Angmar are the same person. Okay. You can find this theory on flyingmoose.org forward slash Tolks arc forward slash theories forward slash Bombadil. <laughs> so the, the rationale for this, I'm not going to read out the whole thing, but it's stuff like Tom saying to Frodo, I was waiting for you. We heard news of you and learned that you were wandering. But Tom had an errand there that he dared not hinder. So the idea is that, like, I mean, what is the idea? That, that he was out, he, he knew that Frodo was on this quest and that he knows that because the Witch King of Angmar knows that because he's a servant of Sauron. Moving on, when Tom is asking the hobbits 
uh, some questions. There's there's a glint in his eyes when he heard of the riders. So there's this idea that he's concerned that his <laughs> his double life might have been noticed. He is that's Kaiser Soze. A, that's <laughs> a little mischievous Kaiser Soze glint in his eyes. There's also this idea that the One Ring has no effect on Tom. Presumably, the Nazgul like would have been able to bring the ring back to Sauron. Otherwise, what is the point of having them out there mm -hmm. after it for him? Yeah. So that one might actually be money as a point. They they their their actual ring desire is is sated enough for them to be able to trans be transporters of it rather than I uh, guess yeah yeah they're ring transporters so yeah. that makes sort of sense maybe um and tom bombadil can see frodo when he puts the ring on which we already know is true of the nazgul right so there's that <laughs> the other theory is that because the barrow white is defeated by tom mm -hmm. which if, if it's a barrow white of the ancient realm of angmar then it's someone who used to be under the control of the Witch King of Angmar, so that's why the Barrowite does what Tom wants it to do. Okay. So that's... But then idea. why... <laughs> I hear all these theories. <laughs> but then why would Tom Bombadil be so concerned with helping the Hobbits reach the edge of the Shire, or, like, get out of the Shire and escape all these perils? I mean, it doesn't really work. There's, like, a million holes in it as a yeah. theory. Um, <laughs> this, yeah, I don't think it... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to give it a bit of airtime because it's so it's it's a fun theory, so but I think it it's got like a million holes in it, um, and I don't think the person who wrote it actually believed in it either. Um, but there's certain pockets of the internet kind of like go to bat for it. Okay. <laughs> Not convinced. Not convinced. So, which of the theories do you like? Um, I think I like the sort of poetry of somehow finding this kind of Santa Claus. Well, Santa, yeah. No, I love the poetry of Santa Claus. No, no, I like the idea of um, a kind of benevolent, mysterious, godlike figure who lives in the woods and can, can command nature, which is surely secretly one of the most hardcore powers of anyone in any of Lord of the Rings, isn't it? The ability to command nature and also, you know, control the supernatural world as well. Who's can it, so interdimensional. <laughs> I mean, and in the figure of this kind of jolly, bumbling, <laughs> singing man. Yeah, the sort um, of Tom is Tom. Who has a beautiful Syria. wife. Yeah. A really smoking hot wife. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Should we talk about his beautiful wife? It's a whole other episode. <laughs> oh, yes, of course, yes. What's your favourite theory? Yeah, I like the Tom is Tom one. Okay. I think it's like in defence of mystery in writing, the idea that you can write something in there that we are never going to know. You won't find out. Yeah. I certainly don't think he's the Witch King of Angmar or God. I do think he could be a, a Maya. There's a really weird passage in The Wind in the Willows that's completely not related in any way to the story at all, where there's just this kind of phantasmagorical quest into the nighttime of nature. Do you remember this? Do you no, remember? I... Again, it's just a completely... It exists within this story... Um, as something that's separate from everything that's going on with Toad to Toad Hall, all that stuff. And it's just a weird sort of um, segue. And normally we'd like to look at sort of portrayals in um, media of these characters on the podcast, but there isn't a lot that we can work with, really, because he's so often cut out of um, adaptations. Yeah, funnily enough, he did actually get included in our old favourite, the lost 1955 BBC radio, radio adaptation, which we love to mention, even though we know we can never know what it sounded like. There aren't any recordings of it. But it's kind of extra gutting that it's lost when you come to talk about Bombadil, because for once, you know, he made it in. Yes, and he was voiced by an actor called Norman Shelley, who is actually a pretty respected actor. Okay, so Norman Shelley actually appeared in a lot of kind of big kind of iconic British films of the 40s and 50s. He's in Went the Day Well, um, he's in The Blue Lamp, he's in um, Oh What a Lovely War later on. So yeah, quite a sort of respected character actor. But there's also a conspiracy theory, right? <laughs> yeah, so supposedly he's also the voice of Winston Churchill. It's not proven, but it's like, it isn't like totally mad actually. So the idea is that Loads of the famous broadcasts made by Churchill during the war were actually performed by Shelley, wow. the actor. 
and what is known for sure and is either the source of the rumour or, you know, evidence for the truth of the theory, depending on how you look at it, is that he was employed when Churchill was ill to deliver some of his speeches. Mm. So we know for sure that he stood in for Churchill like legitimately on a couple of occasions, but some people say that like half of the Churchill recordings you hear are actually Norman Shelley. So we've got a little clip of Churchill for you to listen to and imagine this voice is Tom Bombadil in the 1955 BBC radio adaptation of The Lord of the Rings. So close your eyes and imagine. <laughs> and of a victory, won not only for ourselves, but for all. A victory won not only for our own time, but for the long and better days that are to come. So moving on from that, Winston Churchill cul-de-sac. <laughs> Normally we would now look at Ralph Bakshi, but Bombadil did not make it into the Ralph Bakshi 1978 animated. Um, he did make it into the 1979 Mind's Eye radio broadcast. Shall we have a listen to that? Let's have a listen. Vanish in the sunlight, shrivel like the cold mist, like the winds go wailing, leave your barrow empty till the world is mended. Oh, Tom, Tom. <laughs> Come, breath, Frodo, let's get out to the clean grass. You must help me bear them. Come. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> well, well, he went for it. He did. He sounds like... Uh, an American actor doing a drunk scene from The Merry Wives of Windsor or something like that, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah, very sort of Andrew full, star, full <laughs> staff in an echoey tomb. So that was uh, Bernard Mays playing Tom Bombadil in the 1979 radio adaptation. He was actually called Anthony Mays but credited as Bernard Mays. He was actually a British broadcaster university dean and author who founded America's first suicide prevention hotline. And he's also the guy who adapted it, right? Yep. I guess if you're the guy adapting it, it's kind of your project, you've got some power in the project. So what I'm assuming is that Bernard Mays decided that the plum role that he wanted to play was Tom Bombadil. Apparently so. And who wouldn't choose that role as their, their <laughs> crowning moment? I mean, we go pretty tea hard on the old mind's eye I think but they do tr apparently on quite a small budget they do try to kind of introduce quite a lot of atmosphere I think yeah. like there's they've gone for a sort of tomb thing yeah. in that scene yeah that's all I've got yeah no it's uh it's serviceable when we're also talking about exhaustively every version of Lord of the Rings he's not featured in the Return of the King 1980 Rankin Bass film just by virtue of it not being doesn't cover the bit, no. first bit of the book, so no, he's not in there. Um, I mean, that adaptation is so chaotic, I wouldn't have been surprised if they'd included Gandalf saying, and now I'm off to talk to Tom Bombadil, even though we've never... Or Tom it. Bombadil. Tom Bombadil, even though we don't know who that is. But they don't, fair play to them, they've yep. done the continuity there. <laughs> Next we go on to the 1981 BBC radio adaptation, um, in which he's conspicuously absent. Yeah, not in the 1981 BBC version. Again, I mean, it's a really good dramatisation, that, and they recognise the same thing as Jackson. It just, you can lift him out, and you're trying to find things to lift out because it's a 12-hour-long yeah. adaptation, even in its extended form. Do you know what? If they were doing, like, a big mini-series for Amazon now of The Lord of the Rings, it would absolutely be in there because yeah. you're kind of trying to find material in that sort of situation rather than uh, trying to extract material in yeah. the way that Jackson was. The next iteration is the 1990 Rob Inglis audiobook version. Boy, is Boy he is in this it. one. <laughs> Rob Inglis' favourite thing in the recording is the singing, I think. That's what he really, really loves about doing the whole gig. I think, yeah, it seems like this is maybe his favourite guy to do. Let's, Definitely. Let's have a listen. Suddenly his voice came floating back to them in a loud hello. Hop along, my little friends, up 
the way they windle. Tom's going on ahead, candles for to kindle. Down west sinks the sun, soon you will be groping. When the night shadows fall, then the door will open. Out of the window panes, light will twinkle yellow. Fear no alder black, heed no holly willow. Fear neither root nor bough, Tom goes on before you. Hey, now, merry doll, we'll be waiting for you. So I don't really often share this with people, but that's what it sounds like in my head most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Just a constant narration in Rob Inglis's voice singing everything all the time. You've got a poltergeist and it's Rob yeah. Inglis singing Bombadil. <laughs> it is, unlike anything we've listened to so far, really, in terms of... Um, yeah, just fully going for it, fully singing away. Balls to the wall, bombardier, get down. Yes. <laughs> like, with, with Inglis, we've said in other episodes, like, he's kind of just reading you a story, but he's fully, really going for it with bombardier. Yeah. I think it's one of his strongest interpretations. For sure, for sure. And since we don't have many other alternatives, it's... <laughs> Um, yeah, he's pulling in to, to an early lead yeah. in terms of contenders for the best Bombadil. So he's cut out of the Jackson stories. Certainly uh, is. As we've said, he kind of makes a little appearance in terms of them giving some of his lines to Treebeard, but that's it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose, apart from the slowing of the narrative in the first section of Fellowship, uh, there's certain more goofy, quirky elements to his character and the things that he does that doesn't sit with Jackson's more sombre, action-driven, horror-driven vision of, of certainly the events of Fellowship. Um, God, I mean, I think he would come out like that. I know we try not to talk about the Hobbit films too mm. much, um, but I think he would have come out like Sylvester McCoy doing Radagast. I yeah. Think that, or yeah, yeah. I think it would have been that. Yeah, yeah. So Which is a nightmare. It is a real nightmare. Yeah, it's strange, isn't it? Because... Uh, I don't know, it's part of you sort of like, well, wouldn't it have been nice just to have a little bit of a hint in the way that you have a bit of hints of characters in, you know, you have a bit of the Sackville Bagginses, you have a bit of other characters that have, you know, truncated but at least mentioned in some way in Fellowship. And in <laughs> but what, I mean, in Peter Jack, like, how do you, they're, they're in the forest, they're being chased by ring wraiths, Mary's like, Buckleberry Ferry, uh, yeah. a guy in a hat. Pops yeah. out from behind a tree and goes, "Oh, Tom Bombadil!" <laughs> I don't know. I, like, how do you fit him in? He's so. Yeah. I, something I tell you. Remember when reading when I was reading the book when I was little, and I used to find the ring race stuff so genuinely terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, I think particularly the stuff in the dell and Weathertop. Like even to this day, I find a really creepy passage. And I used to really look forward to because you, you get one encounter with the ring race, then you get the old forest, Tom Bombadil, then you go back into the world of like ring race and mm -hmm. Bree and Strider. I used to find the old forest and the Barrow White stuff, as eerie as they are, kind of a relatively sort of comforting place to be. I used to look forward to getting to that bit mm -hmm. after you start to engage with the Black Riders. It's like, yeah, I don't want to see those guys for a bit. Let's yeah. go hang out with Tom Bombadil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in a in a cinematic medium with only a very limited amount of time to work with, maybe it wouldn't have been. I'm just picturing him popping out. Just what, Stephen Fry. What, when they're doing the the ring race stuff and there's some guy in like bright blue and yellow <laughs> with red cheeks and a it's hot This guy wife. from like an old pub sign who's towed up, showed up. <laughs> yeah, they, that's probably the way you sort of do a little nod to him, isn't it? It's just have like a picture of him on the wall in the... Prancing Pony or something yeah. like that, just like an unexplained pub portrait. Yeah. So anyway, he's gone from the Jackson films, um, R.I.P. The final iteration we have is uh, Andy Serkis reading Bombadil and singing Bombadil and giving Rob Inglis a bit of a run for his money. Oh yeah, it's a real delight. The book we've actually got to listen, I'm not sure it includes a song, but it is super key Bombadil lore. It's where he asks Frodo about the ring. Mm -hmm. and demonstrates the fact that the ring appears to have no power over him, which is, again, one of those moments where you're like, okay, this is not just a comedy singing guy. This is... Mm. This is the Witch King of Angmar. This is the Witch King of Angmar. Show me the precious ring, he said suddenly in the midst of the story. And Frodo, to his own astonishment, drew out the chain from his pocket and unfastening the ring handed it at once to Tom. It seemed to grow larger as it lay for a moment on his big brown-skinned hand. 
Then suddenly he put it to his eye and laughed. For a second, the hobbits had a vision, both comical and alarming, of his bright blue eye gleaming through a circle of gold. Then Tom put the ring round the end of his little finger and held it up to the candlelight. For a moment, the hobbits noticed nothing strange about this. Then they gasped. There was no sign of Tom disappearing. Tom laughed again, and then he spun the ring in the air, and it vanished with a flash. Frodo gave a cry, and Tom leaned forward and handed it back to him with a smile. Frodo looked at it closely and rather suspiciously, like one who has lent a trinket to a juggler. It was the same ring, or looked the same and weighed the same, for that ring had always seemed to Frodo to weigh strangely heavy in the hand. But something prompted him to make sure. He was perhaps a trifle annoyed with Tom for seeming to make so light of what even Gandalf thought so perilously important. He waited for an opportunity when the talk was going again and Tom was telling an absurd story about badgers and their queer ways. Then he slipped the ring on. Mary turned towards him to say something and gave a start and checked an exclamation. Frodo was delighted in a way. It was his own ring, all right, for Mary was staring blankly at his chair and obviously could not see him. He got up and crept quietly away from the fireside towards the outer door. Hey there, cried Tom, glancing towards him with a most seeing look in his shining eyes. Hey, come Frodo there, where be you a-going? Old Tom Bombadil's not as blind as that yet. Take off your golden ring, your hands will fare without it. Come back, leave your game, and sit down beside me. We must talk a while more and think about the morning. So, actually introducing some singing into a bit where it's not written as if it's sung. No, although the kind of cadence or the writing of his dialogue is sort of weirdly full of kind of the hint of some sort of... The haze and hoes. Yeah, and just like some kind of pentameter of some sort. I don't know. It's weird, isn't it? Yeah. And actually, that made me think we mentioned Sylvester McCoy and Stephen Fry, but I think Circus actually, you know, not behind any kind of CGI. Like, he's someone who could do a credible turn as Tom Bombadil, like the age he is now, um, yeah. more than the age he was when they were doing the PJ yeah. adaptations. I could also imagine Bill Nye. Yeah. I can see it. A credible Bombadil. Um, yeah. I really like the circus version. I think he might be the best of the Bombadils. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Sorry, Rob Inglis. Oh, poor Rob Inglis, because he put such a lot into it as he well. He was winning and then he lost. It was it's like me in the fucking competition, the, the game. <laughs> the page off. The page off. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens today. <laughs> anyway, that's for the end of the episode. We've talked about uh, how often he's cut out of adaptations and in a way, contrary to a lot of the other things which Tolkien took issue with in adaptation form, um, sort of changes and removals and things, he actually advocated for removing Bombadil from a possible film adaptation, right? Yeah, it's interesting. Or rather, he advocated for doing that rather than getting him wrong. Right, yes. (laughs) It's a very specific caveat. But yeah, let's have the uh, let's have the letter where he's tra- so he's talking about a theoretical film treatment that never got made, yeah. um, and critiquing it kind of quite heavily. The first paragraph misrepresents Tom Bombadil. He is not the owner of the woods, and he would never make any such threat. Old scamp. This is a good example of the general tendency that I find in Zed to reduce and lower the tone towards that of a more childish fairy tale. The expression does not agree with the tone of Bombadil's long later talk, and though that is cut, there is no need for its indications to be disregarded. I am sorry, but I think the manner of the introduction of Goldberry is silly, and on a par with Old Scamp. It also has no warrant in my tale. We are not in Fairyland, but in real riverlands in autumn. Goldberry represents the actual seasonal changes in such lands, 
Personally, I think she had far better disappear than make a meaningless appearance. Yeah, so he's not always against changes in discussions about adapting his work, but he's got a very strong gut reaction against stuff like this apparent idea that uh, Tom Bombadil was going to say old scamp. Yeah, about... it's getting into the actual <laughs> tiny <laughs> micro level, isn't it? He clearly was upset by Z trying to introduce that. Yes. So we heard it in the circus clip, but I do think one of the most interesting things about the Bombadil episode is the way that Tolkien deliberately destabilises the ring, which he hasn't set up for very long in the grand scheme of the novel. Like You've introduced the ring as this big, terrifying, I am the one powerful thing that can bring about the destruction of the entire universe. In a strict like Hollywood storytelling mode, you then have to protect that idea. The ring... You, you can't be undermining the thing that you've set up as like at the heart of your whole whole narrative. And yet Tolkien does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like he's just told us a couple of chapters earlier that this thing is so important that nothing can destroy it, that no one can, you know, Gandalf, this really powerful wizard, can't stand to even touch it because he'll be corrupted by it. And then suddenly you have this sort of juggler in a forest, yeah. like <laughs> playing with it and yeah. pretending to make it, and like making it of no importance um and i guess he lampshades that as well by having frodo sort of be really annoyed that tom is making light of something that even gandalf thought to be so important um but i think it's another way in which he signifies to us that bombadil is slightly out of place in the narrative that we're in a slightly different realm to the rest of the story yeah because nowhere else is the ring kind of something to be trifled with yeah. Does he find other um, kind of... Because one thing that seems to be coming across in all these episodes that we're doing is the idea of um, mirrors and parallels and equivalences across the story between different characters, facets of certain characters being reflected or presented as opposite in other characters across sort of nations and so forth. Is there anything later in the story or any other part of this story? Obviously, you have the Ents who belong to more of a more closely to the forest and more closely to a kind of rural idyll but they're not really the same as as Bombadil at all really are they their their whole kind of modus operandi is completely different are there any characters that find an equivalence with Bombadil or is he completely unique I think it's only theoretically Gandalf right because of that pairing where Gandalf says he wants to go and have a long talk with him at the end mm. um but otherwise I think he's pretty singular and on his own and obviously he's got a wife so there's a sort of like pairing there but that's a different kind of pairing really mm-hmm. um I like that there's this discussion at the council of Elrond after they hear Frodo's account of how Bombadil doesn't seem affected by the ring um there's this idea of like should we send the ring back to him to look after Tolkien gets around the problem that he's written in for himself by saying that he would be an unsafe guardian of the ring. That he would, like, yes, the ring has no power over him, but he doesn't have power over the ring, put it that way around. And that he would kind of soon forget about it and that such things have no hold on his mind. It's uh, the line from Tolkien that always comes into my head when I lose yet another debit card or mobile phone. Such things have no hold on his (laughs) mind. It's uh, me with yeah. those kinds of things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, that's that's what makes him an unsafe guardian. And the one thing that they can't be considering is an unsafe guardian. They just like they debate all of the different things that they could do with the ring. Someone's idea is to fling it into the sea. Um, Gandalf's like, well, that might work for a while, but <laughs> like eventually. Well, it was in a river for a while, wasn't yeah, it? Got yeah. Found. Yeah. So they do go down the we've got to destroy it route after exploring this idea of or keeping it safe but I think someone else also says you know such a like the power to resist Sauron is not in him unless it is in the very hills but then we've seen that Sauron has the power to torture and twist the very earth I'm paraphrasing obviously but again an idea linking Bombadil to a sort of elemental natural spirit. Hmm. Does it maybe is it more the case coming back to this idea of um, warfare and conquering and um, vanquishing enemies as a means to an end to protect the things that are important to protect rather than the need for a heroic success. Is Bombadil somehow an embodiment of the things that we ultimately 
are fighting for in this universe or are worth fighting for. So the idea of a rural paradise or something which is closer to nature and further away from the preoccupations of man and elves and so forth. Is it more that? Yeah, he's definitely, the Tolkien talk, has talked about him, uh, I think in even one of the passages we read out today as the embodiment of the countryside, the spirit of he the countryside. He says literally Oxfordshire. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, you lived in Oxford. Oh, yeah, I did you? when I was a very small child. Like the idea of this area being a bit like sort of the Chilterns or something like that mm. is very, very sort of vivid, isn't it? Fun trivia: I've lived in all the same places as Tolkien. I've, oh, wow. li- I've lived in Bournemouth, Birmingham, Oxford, as did he. Wow! I now live in London, where he didn't live. But right. yeah, I've covered off the main three. You've done the big tour. <laughs> <laughs> Should we play the game? So now my favourite part of the podcast, um, or at least it was my favourite for the first week where I was ahead um, in this game that we like to call the page off. Now it's the bane of my life because I'm so far behind Catherine. Um, But if you'd like to play along at home, we're about to play the page off. It's a competitive game that you can play at home on it with any edition of Lord of the Rings and any online Lord of the Rings quote generator. Uh, We're using one from the site happycow.com. Certainly are. Um, so it works like this. You score points based on how far away from the page you land. If you guessed exactly the right page, you would score zero. And so we're trying to score the lowest number of points possible. We're using a 1990 reprint of the 1966 HarperCollins edition, but you can obviously use any edition at home. OK, so loading up the quote generator. Load it up. <laughs> I wish it need not have happened in my time, said Frodo. So do I, said Gandalf, and so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. Lovely quote. This is one of the ones that I sort of hold in my heart. Yeah. Um, Lord of the Rings life advice from Gandalf. Yeah. So it's Frodo wishing the ring had never come to him. Yeah. And it's Early Doors Fellowship. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we've had some quotes previously from the first hundred pages or so of Fellowship, haven't we? So that maybe we have. We can do it sort of strategically and try and remember back to where we landed before. Let's hear your strategic guess <laughs> for it. Um, well, I think the... Is it definitely... It's a bit of a red herring. I think in the films you hear Gandalf say this quote like in Frodo's memory mm-hmm. so there's, part, there's part of me that's like is it much later but I think in the book you're right I think it comes early mm. um, probably in the shadow of the past that chapter where Gandalf's like here's the deal with the ring mm. part of my brain is like could it be in Rivendell after he's reunited with Gandalf but I don't think it is no I think it's still Shire stuff. Yeah, yeah, so do I. And so do all who live to see such times. Yeah, we just have to decide which page to <laughs> go with. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, maybe a sort of like page 90 type of guess is where I'm going to end up with this. Yeah. I'm still pretty convinced that it's Frodo and Gandalf in, in the Shire. Yeah, I'm going to go 70. 70 from Paul... Yeah, I'm going to... 80? <laughs> We're going to go 80. Okay. Before we reveal our fates, just a quick reminder that um, Paul is on 301 points, I'm on 176 points, and the aim is to score the lowest number of points possible. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. First of all, what is on page 70? Oh, wow. 70 is three is company. Oh, so we've both... We're both going a bit too late. Potentially gone too high. Yeah. So 70, three years company, lots of stuff with the Hobbits and Pippin and Sam all, yeah, hanging out together on the journey. Three Hobbits. Three Hobbits. And then on page, what did you say, 80? I said 80, so I've... 80 is more of, well... Lost out here, I think. 80, you're just off, you're just off a shortcut to mushrooms. So they're just about so, to piss yeah. off Farmer Maggot. Yeah. Well, not a vintage round of the page off, and we need to try and track down this this actual Gandalf chat. So 
It was actually on page 50. They just sat up all night talking about the ring and so forth. With page 50, that puts you on 30 and me on 20. Yeah, so... Which is not too bad. Not too bad. Added to our running totals, that puts you on 321 and me on... And I'm on 206. So after five rounds of the page off, I remain in the lead, achieving my goal of destroying Paul and casting him into the cracks of doom. Indeed. So you have 206 and I have 321. But it could all change. It could all change. All you need is one big old misstep from Bray here. (laughs) See you next week. Thank you for listening to Not Another Fucking Elf, a Lord of the Rings character guide podcast by me, Paul Ridd. And me, Catherine Bray. We are a self-produced podcast. Please follow us at Not Another Elf on all good social media platforms. Let us know what you think. And it would be great if you could give us not one, not three, not seven, but five stars for Mortal Podcasts on your podcast app. Thanks to Tommaso Alietti for handling the digital wizardry and Charlie Shackleton for our lovely cover art. All clips are copyright their respective copyright holders and we strongly urge you to go out and buy the 1978 Ralph Bakshi Lord of the Rings, 1979 Mind's Eye radio adaptation, 1980 Rankin Bass Return of the King, 1981 BBC Radio Lord of the Rings, 2001 New Line Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings and the 1990 Rob Inglis and 2020 Andy Serkis Lord of the Rings audiobooks both from HarperCollins. And by the book. So many nice editions of the book out there. We also recommend the Humphrey Carpenter biography as a starting point if you're curious about the life of the man himself. And the Collected Letters, also collated by Humphrey Carpenter with Christopher Tolkien. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss next week when we're looking at somebody evil. A big villain episode coming up, so that's your clue for next week. This has been Paul Ridd. And I'm Catherine Bray. And that's it for now. That's the end of the podcast. The grey rain curtain of this world has rolled back and all has turned to silver glass.